Hello everybody, whenever Hamza the liar tortoise opens his mouth or puts pen to paper, it causes muscular contractions in my body which feels as though I'm losing body fluids through every conceivable body crevice or opening. This time around, I, there's no date so I'll take 28, 20, 13, he has outdone himself once again. He is, well, he's releasing a draft, a, a pre-release draft, a, a released pre-release. Is, is there such a thing as a draft after release status? Well, I've never released a draft in my life, as my draft developed into a release version before I released it. My versions 0. Dot whatever were not released, but version 1.0 was the release version. I've never released a draft. Hamza does. He makes this very clear by labeling it a pre-release draft 0.9b. He probably uses it to let others fix his mistakes. <clears throat> this is serious stuff. He mumbles, picking himself up from the floor. Hamza outlines the topic, making it clear that over time, Muslims were using science to verify miracles, which is impossible from the word go because science doesn't do magic tricks. Also, science was used to verify that a discourse was divine, divine with a, with a capital D. And that is equally impossible right from the start. Science does not concern itself with anything supernatural, be it ghosts or gods. So, the entire essay will be about the impossible. <laughs> Great stuff. I mean, the text he is referring to is the Quran. It, I mean, it's a, it's a vague, unstructured book, not a discourse, which I have down as a, as a formal discussion of a subject or the formal treatment of a subject. But whatever, if he needs words which sound important to make a, a boring and primitive subject more interesting or upgrade a book, uh, I mean, it's it's just that a book as vague and ambiguous as the Quran just doesn't deserve to be called a discourse in my eyes. In linguistics, it can be, well, any unit of connected speech. But when reading a book, I would not use this expression for sure. But never mind la, not important. Hamza, acting like the academic he wishes he were, provides a link to Google in the form of a footnote showing the result of a search. Wow. But well, when he makes a huge claim, such as the claim that Islamic classical scholarly tradition was engaged in a debate as to whether to use science, there is no source. I actually doubt there is one. And then he just made that up simply because it sounds nice. Our Hamza now goes off into his usual waffling mode, saying that the birth of this, what he calls movement, was based on a book from the 70s, but it was born in the 80s, of, of course. And, I mean, let's take a quick look at the sequence of events. I've done this before, but maybe people don't remember. And in, in the 70s, a Muslim from Yemen, Abdul Mayed al-Zindani, studied in Cairo, was fired. I mean, he wanted to stay there, but they didn't want him there. And he went to Saudi Arabia, where he and his, and his uh, friend and, and fundraiser, Osama bin Laden, embarked on several projects together. Zindani, a one-man deception party, founded the Commission on Scientific Science in the Quran and Sunnah based in Saudi Arabia. He found a French doctor at the Saudi court, Dr. Maurice Bouquet, who delivered the, the basis for Bouquetism, the, the Bible, the Quran and science. A hilarious book. Zindani then found another doctor, this time from Canada, a Dr. Keith Moore, who released one of his editions of a textbook which also became a hit with gullible Muslims. And even today, some Muslims call him a scholar, full of admiration for his outstanding capabilities to lie to Muslims and deceive them for so many years. Well, it does take special skills to do that. The back cover of the Bouquet book claims that as a surgeon, I mean, he's if he was a doctor, gastroenterologist or something, Maurice Bouquet has often been in a situation where he was able to examine not only people's bodies, but their souls. How does a surgeon examine a soul? Can he cut it out of something? I mean, all right, we know now what, what level these doctors are operating on. 
And, and today we know that both these charlatans and medical doctors went ahead and made huge amounts of money selling complete, utter nonsense in the form of ridiculous claims without much effort. So next, Zindani branched out and used different deceptive tactics and now produced a movie using non-Muslim academics. They were not prominent Western academics or eminent non-Muslim scholars, as Hamza would like to think, but university professors or scientists who went not to one, as Hamza mistakenly claims, but several conferences. The movie was edited in a way that it seemed that they were making positive remarks regarding scientific contents in the Quran, which they were not, as they themselves attested recently in interviews by the Wall Street Journal and the vlogger The Rationalizer. The lies and deception did work, however, through 30 or 40 years, making people like Zakir Naik and Harun Yahya very rich people. Maybe Hamza thought in his naivety and largely unused brain, he could latch on to that. He probably, well, he has not realized yet that a few years ago the facts emerged and the entire movement claiming scientific miracles, well, it died down. And he should know, as he was one of the last to experience this when his embarrassingly bad paper on the scientific accuracy of embryology in the Quran was completely destroyed and, and I mean, it was shredded and shown to be utterly fallacious and wrong, demonstrating that biased and preconceived research delivers only the results you want and not the truth. People who were gullible enough to join Islam due to its modern appeal and the apparent scientific accuracy were soon disillusioned and were appalled by the dishonest and deceptive marketing tricks used by the salespeople and scouts. They, well, they left Islam just as quickly as they had joined. Um, fortunately, I have not heard of any, any of them having been killed, as is demanded by Muslim clerics over and over. But one learns to be grateful for things like that. So this is where we are today. And for the first time, I mean, I was quite surprised, Hamza actually acknowledges this. He, he actually brings up entire paragraphs which make total sense to the extent that I thought he finally got it. But then he, <laughs> he writes something silly again, showing he's a good copy-paste artist, but does not have the brain to actually process the contained information and understand it. He uses the ideas of a Muslim scientist who deplores the state of education amongst Muslims and fights for less dogma and more knowledge. But Hamza does not really understand the professor. Well, he never has. Yeah, we have several instances of this. But he just pretends he does. But now he has a problem because he says the Quran is not really scientifically accurate because science is not 100% accurate. But then why use this unreliable and inaccurate science to verify the divine, with a capital D, origins of the Quran? What he tries to do is to soften the reliability of science, but is still faced with the problem of the many, many mistakes in the Quran which are not based on science. He concedes the errors of scientific accuracy, but can't allow for divine errors. So he, he does today what the so-called scholar did with me two years ago in, in the Fana in, in Doha. He said that over time, scientists will conclude that sperm is not produced in the testicles, but in the torso, hoping that unreliable science will one day say the same as the Quran. But excuse me, then the Quran would be just as unreliable and inaccurate as science. I mean, you can't have it both ways. But Hamza is, is not honest enough to let go of this stupid, divine and inerrant concept in the Quran, which is actually by now killing Islam. Maybe he thinks that because the internet is not mentioned in the Quran, it does not exist. But it is there and delivering the facts which lead to more and more questions around the Quran without any convincing answers. In the section on miracles, he loses the plot completely, mixing scientific sentences with naturalistic explanations and linguistics. But maybe that's why it's a pre-release draft 0.9b. <laughs> oh no, here go the muscles again. <laughs> Sorry, this is serious stuff. He now softens up the text of the Quran in that 
words may mean anything or something or may not. So the words, there is no God but God or don't eat pork, may mean something completely different today, according to Hamza. He tries and represents what the devout Muslim, Dr. Nida Gesum, an Algerian astrophysicist and professor of physics in the UAE, has written. Now, this scientist is I mean, he's still a creationist who loves to tinker with evolution, trying to find or propagate any type of alternative explanation, even though he accepts the basic theory and hates rejectionists like Harun Yahya. Reading about this guy and what he has written is quite fascinating, and I need to, I mean, in all honesty, congratulate Hamza on this find. Dr. Gesum writes academic and scientific papers. He does an excellent job when it comes to assessing Islam, where he says, while there is no doubt in people's mind that human knowledge evolves and grows, it is often understood that religions, especially Islam, are absolute, immutable and transcendent principles, which are set in rigid frames of reference. And Dr. Gesson then takes a refreshingly different approach towards Islam and the Quran, rejecting the classic revelation via angel, story and, and, and sees the text as a collection of very loose indications. He does fall <laughs> into the propaganda trap of the so-called Islamic Golden Age, but does point out that the lives of the protagonists at the time were hardly considered Islamic at all. He shows the dilemma of the literal Quran and says that the Quran must be taken metaphorically to be applicable in different times and by different people and is quite happy to be accused of cherry picking. In an exciting critique of Gesson's book by Dr. Rana Dajani, an assistant biology professor in Jordan, writes, In this presentation, Gesson addresses the reader's intellect and leaves it to him or her to draw conclusions concerning science and religion. Now, those are wise words. And then on evolution, she openly admits, I will focus on the issue of Islam and evolution. But evolution is a fact that cannot be denied. We see manifestations of it in the design of drugs and blah, blah, blah. And then the fact that a sound scientific theory is so vehemently denied by Muslim scientists, let alone the layperson, on the basis of belief, not logic, is scary. Because it makes one wonder what else is being denied in the name of religion. Wow. But Hamza does not take advantage of the brilliant brain of these scientists and the huge reservoir of wisdom available to him here. But the copy-paste artist, we just get two or three words from the book. Without any explanation on how Dr. Gissim applies this idea in practice, we are told that now we get a new approach which is demonstrated by using words which look exactly the same as they did in Hamza's previous embarrassingly bad essays. It has the same result in that premise one is that the Quran is never wrong, and premise two is that if reality is different from the Quran, reality needs to be changed and adapted to the Quran. He spouts total and absolute nonsense, claiming that the sun swimming in an orbit around Earth makes sense, in light of today's scientific findings, the celestial mechanics. <laughs> we then get to Hamza's pet word, alaka, and the millions of meanings it can have, and how a multi-layered Quran can have any meaning you want at the time you need it. He can't get over it, and is unable to write anything but stuff that results in laughter and derision. Doesn't he learn? Hamza is, I mean, he's, he's truly embarrassing. I mean, even if he were a sixth grader, he, he takes what we've shown him several times and, and now acknowledges that we were right all along. And the Quran copies or reflects the knowledge at the time. Alaka equals blood clot. But what is hilarious is that he actually says that, and, and I'll get this, his God agrees with the predominant scientific view of the time. Because the Quran is God's word. So, God agrees. So Hamza now puts more importance on what science says than what is in his magic book. He claims the word alaka means blood clot or worm or leech. Now, how does he know when it means which? Maybe it was leech in the 7th century and blood clot in the 14th and worm today. Or none of the above. Nobody knows. Hamza, in his wisdom, which I hope someone will be able to demonstrate at some stage, claims that 
It is so obvious that the Quran in using the rubber word alaka must mean blood clot when read for the first time. What is his reasoning? No. But after a few days or years or decades or centuries, the word blood clot changes into worm or leech. None of this is specified or with, with any evidence attached. He says this can be verified using several instructions on what to say and how to think. It takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it can latch onto. And the height of his inability to grasp reality and the way science works is demonstrated in these very steps at the end of his pamphlet. He mentions historical statements in the Quran without specifying what a historical statement is and without providing a single example. How are we supposed to know these things? He mentions a linguistic and literary miracle which everyone knows does not exist. Come on, we have the internet. Then we get the preserved Quran, which is nonsense, the religious messages and the killer argument, other remarkable features, which anyone can make up by the looks of it. Oh boy, how bad can it get? <laughs> well, it gets worse. Okay, I know, I know, I sound supercilious, but it's really totally impossible to stay serious with this. Because really it does get worse, because he actually tries to apply his favorite word alaka as a multi-layer, multifunctional word, which can mean different things, and all of them are wrong. So one of the things it can mean is a leech. Let's take a look at a leech, the medicinal leech. Uh, but why the medicinal leech? Does the Quran say anything about a medicinal leech? No. Well, why not? Because worms or leeches come in different sizes, shapes and colors. And the Quran does not specify whether it's a worm, a leech or a blood clot. So which one does the embryo look like? At what stage is the embryo supposed to look like a leech? From what day to what day? Come on, you say this is scientifically accurate. So where's the scientifically accurate data? All Hamza has is one single word, alaka which he says meant blood clot at some stage, and at some stage it magically transformed into leech. But why not worm? Because all a leech is, is a blood-sucking worm. Does an embryo suck blood? Is it like a worm? No. Does it feed on blood like a leech? No. Blood is a transport mechanism in the human body. The leech increases body size ten times when drinking blood or sucking blood. Does an embryo do this? No. The leech is approximately, what, 13 centimeters long. Is the embryo? No. It's two or three centimeters long. Posterior and anterior suckers. Does an embryo have this? No. It has 60 to 100 teeth. Does an embryo have teeth? No. A leech I mean, it secretes a substance called hirudin. Does a... <laughs> A leech secretes a substance called hirudin. Does an embryo secrete any substance called <laughs> No, it does not. The leech clings to its brain. It attaches to the outer skin. An embryo does not cling, it floats. And it does not attach to outer skin. The leech lives in fresh water. <laughs> the embryo does not. It, the leech spend most of the time buried in muddy bottom of a pond. It has five pairs of eyes. Have you ever seen an embryo with five pairs of eyes? Or chemoreceptors near the head like the leech? Leeches breed in summer. An embryo I don't think does. Another feature of a leech is that it lays eggs. I have never seen an embryo lay a single egg. And the worst thing is all leeches are hermaphroditic. In other words, they are both male and female. They are not created in pairs as male or female. So the leech is probably the worst example for Quranic veracity that you could have chosen, you oaf. I mean, this is an embryo at around 40 days when it is four or five centimeters long. Does it look like a leech? These are the stages of an embryo. Where does it look like a leech? In the real world out here, 
A human embryo results from a cell, the ovum, being fertilized by a sperm cell. Any mention of this by Hamza? And if you have doubts, well, Hamza has the solution. Special pleading. Because God really exists, and if he exists, he must be right. Why? Well, because he's a God. And science can be wrong. Take it from God, um, Hamza. Finally, it could be argued that a verse could be deemed as more like uh, yes, a, a scientific miracle, which he said in the beginning doesn't even exist. There's not a whole lot of confidence out there. So, finally, we get the same as we had before. The conclusion does absolutely nothing. It does zilch, nada, zero, to the existing bouquetism and gullible Muslims. It's the same identical deception. Does Samza care about the education of his fellow Muslims? No, he just wants them dumb and prostrating in submission because Allah knows best. He says you can test any of the laughable claims against this list, but if you do, you come out with the same and identical result as before. So, is the universe expanding? Yes, and all the points are checked. The same goes for the Big Bang in the Quran and all the other ludicrous claims. It's just a bad joke. It's an attempt to sound different, and as though this was now a more modern approach. It is not. In contrast, take... I mean, this is the simple three-step test I developed, what, two or three years ago. Is it really a miracle? In other words, did anybody know about it? Is this really something that nobody could have conceived of at the time? Number two, is it really mentioned like that in Scripture? In other words, are we stretching the words, or are these really words that are being used to describe this? And number three, does it reflect reality? And then all of a sudden, all these claims turn out to be completely wrong. Now, because Hamza is intellectually challenged, he passes the buck and hides, says scholars, thinkers and apologists should develop this further. Oh well. This is just another pathetic attempt at sounding educated and delivering a complete fail. Why doesn't he just shut up and stop embarrassing himself and his fellow Muslims? Thank you for your time.